All right, everybody, we're going to get started in just a moment. We'll just give another second for uh, folks to join from the previous session. We'll give it another 60 seconds. All right. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're going to start up with our next session. Exciting. Uh, this session is going to be titled ML Ops for AI Powered Applications, The Journey from Dev to Prod. With us, we've got Miriam, and I'm going to turn it over to Miriam. Thank you so very much. Uh, hi, guys. And uh, yes, uh, my number, my name is uh, Miriam Fentanes, and I am here to talk about MLOps for AI at the edge. So what we have seen in most of our customers is that uh, even though they have really good ideas and a lot of projects about how to use AI to enhance the experience for their customers, it's really important for, for them to be successful to be able to operationalize AI models. Not only at the edge, it's already um, difficult to do it with uh, regular models and more traditional uh, architectures. But when we are talking about the edge, uh, we're seeing that there are added layers of complexity. So we um, there, there was a study and they made uh, they ask uh, all of these different companies how long it took them to actually go from idea to putting the model into production. And the uh, half of the respondents said that it was between seven and 12 months, uh, which is a lot. Uh, and uh, a quarter of the response, a little bit over the quarter, said it was a year or more. And only uh, a very short 15% said that it was between three and six months. So in terms of being able to uh, get some value out of AI initiatives, seven to 12 months, it's a lot of time, uh, especially now with agile practices in um, when application teams are delivering new versions of their applications every three weeks or every month, uh, a year, it's, it's a lot of lost opportunity. Uh, so what happened is when you look closely at what are the main things hindering the ability to successfully put models into production, uh, most of the people uh, often think about uh, how to train a model and all of the complications around selecting an algorithm, um, having uh, a data scientist uh, train uh, a model using the data, and but really the complexity on, uh, oper on successfully operationalizing a model is around everything else other than actually uh, training a model. So if you see in this picture that small uh, white square is uh, what you need or, or the, the complexity added for training the model and everything else is around some uh, architectural challenges or uh, things that are not really related to the model, how to handle and manage configuration, uh, how to do data collection, lineage, how to do resource management. Uh, the serving infrastructure is a really uh, big one. So how to make sure that uh, your models are um, doing inference in the infrastructure, monitoring, management. So we can see that uh, not only the complexity is on non-AI related uh, topics, but uh, also when uh, Google analyzed the, 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 the root cause of most of the problems on their uh, machine learning systems, they realized that uh, I think it was 90% of them were non-AI related, they were related to the infrastructure. So being able to solve all of those things needed uh, to successfully deploy models is very important. And this is exactly what um, OpenShift Data Hub helps you uh, do. It's not really about uh, producing models, but giving, getting 
um, having the ability to iterate really fast and produce models that you can test in production and monitor to make sure that the predictions are correct. And if not, being able to start the whole process again in an uh, automated, uh, reproducible, auditable way. Um, so if you see the stages to the, the, the architecture or the, the, the process of successfully using AI, uh, you can divide it into uh, four stages. Uh, one relating to data gather and preparation of data, storage, exploration, uh, sanitizing, uh, if you are doing uh, real life uh, streaming of data while well, stream processing, then you have all of the activities around developing a model um, where the main tools are notebooks and machine learning libraries, um, and also some tools to do experimentation. And these two stages is sometimes known also as the inner loop. Uh, when you once that the model is trained, uh, you go to the outer loop, which includes everything for deploying the model in an application, which is um, packaging the model, making sure that it has an API or, or a way to be uh, accessed to send uh, data in and get an inference back. Um, the ability to deploy the model where the infrastructure is, whether it's centralized, cloud native, on-premise, uh, distributed, or, or even edge. And then once the model is deployed and is actually serving, which is uh, doing inference, uh, how do you monitor the model and how do you manage it, ma manage their, its life cycle like? Uh, how do you trigger retraining when uh, the predictions are no longer accurate? Uh, how do you handle versioning of that model? How do you do things like A-B testing, CI-CD? Um, and this is known as the outer loop. If you see the, the stages, uh, they are not really that different from uh, what we've been doing for years now on regular application development. Uh, the only difference that I, or one of the difference that I see is that uh, with uh, projects or applications that are powered by AI, it's even more necessary to um, develop this um, muscle memory and this is skills to constantly iterate. And it's more important because uh, the models are only good as the data and the data is uh, reflecting of reality and reality is always changing. So uh, your application and your model has uh, a, a, a short shelf life because uh, data is constantly changing. So being able to iterate is uh, a must. It's not something uh, nice to have. It's, it's something that you definitely have to do at some point uh, to reflect the, act, the, the, the current state uh, of the world. And when we talk about edge, um, and deploying things at the edge. What we've learned is that edge is not really a, a single location or a single place. It's not something like you can pinpoint and say, well, we're going to deploy here, and this is the edge, and these are the conditions. It's more like, like a broad uh, region. It's like a continuum. Uh, devices at the edge of the network can communicate uh, laterally with each other. Uh, they can communicate north to court. Um, data services or south to more low level uh, services. And all of these uh, devices have different characteristics. Uh, there, there are different layers at the edge. Uh, you can have a very constrained, tiny ML type of edge. You can have edge on devices that are mm, capable to have uh, rel or, or, or support some sort of continuization. Uh, so it, it's really on a spectrum. And uh, so when we were thinking about designing solutions for Edge, we focused more on what are the characteristics that make Edge unique. Uh, in, in Edge computing comes in many forms, but what are the common things in all of these different forms? How Edge computing is different than traditional, let's say, on-premise um, computing or distributed computing, or why do I need to, to to, to take some actions for edge. And we saw that these characteristics are usually uh, disadvantaged networks. Uh, even if they're, when people talk about edge, they imagine really remote uh, locations, really hard to be, hardly accessible. Uh, it's, it's not really. Um, something like a factory floor could be 
could could be intentionally uh, air gapped or poorly connected to the outside for security reasons. So disadvantaged networks, it's kind of like a, a common thing. Uh, either uh, denied uh, or firewalled, have you firewalled, disconnected with intermittent connection, uh, with low bandwidth, like uh, let's imagine uh, an oil well where, where you can only transmit very um, limited amounts of data, uh, where you have uh, really high latency because of uh, of the remoteness, and you need really slow, uh, sorry, really low latency, uh, because maybe you are operating operating devices um, that if uh, failed or if they have any blip could uh, actually hurt people, um, and um, you know all all of these aspects in, in regards of uh, of connectivity is it's something that characterizes edge. The other one is that they are data centric architectures. They are focused around the sources of data and the storage nearest to the point of generation. And this doesn't mean that, you know, uh, all of this data is valuable, something that also is very common in edge, in, especially when we are processing signals is that um, you have massive amounts of low value data. <laughs> so uh, it's it's architectures that are heavily depending on, on, on massive amounts of data and, and to being close to the sources to uh, do the processing there. And then the other one is um, because of uh, some, some part, in, because of the disadvantaged network, you have a different management model. So instead of having a centralized uh, core um, control plane managing the workloads where you push any updates uh, or, or you push any changes onto the worker nodes, here, uh, because of the limited resources and because most of the times the priority is um, keeping the resources for processing or for other uh, more ha more critical uh, task. Usually, the management is follows a pool model. So when the edge node is ready, it will go out, phone home, and ask uh, for the latest updates. So all of these things are are uh, different capabilities of edge. So when um, we started thinking in the community about what do we want to or, or what is the thing that we need to solve so our customers are more successful when deploying at the edge? Or what do uh, users need to do to be more successful when deploying at the edge? Uh, we think that the main, the main characteristic needs to be flexibility. So any component or any workload that you want to deploy at the edge needs to be able to tolerate the conditions uh, and needs to be able to fit in whatever layer uh, on this continuum you want to be. It doesn't have to be necessarily all edge. It, it, it can be in the core, but it has to be portable. Uh, it has to be consistent. So, so the same uh, setup and the same workload that you are testing in the core on the uh, on, on public cloud has to. You, you have to have the assurance that that same setup and that same uh, workload, it's going to be uh, deployed exactly like that at the edge. So you can decide the optimal locations of services and capabilities uh, determined by the trade-offs between the constraints. So if it's very expensive to uh, hold back all of the data from the far edge where a device is constantly uh, emitting uh, signals, and it's really uh, expensive to send all of that via uh, the internet to a core location. Well, maybe the, the best location for the processing service of these signals or, or the models that are processing the signal is uh, at the far edge. Uh, for monitoring capabilities, maybe you want to be able to monitor in an intermediate location, let, let's, let's say in a server room, um, in a, on a store, you want to monitor the algorithms that do face recognitions on cameras or that do um, visual inspection or, or something like that. Uh, so you have to be able to install the monitoring pieces or components of your AI platform um, on the near edge as well as on the far edge. So the most important thing is that 
you can put that that users need to have the flexibility to put the workload where it makes sense. And thinking about that, um, we set out to find some of the deployment patterns that we most commonly see for Edge. And we're seeing that uh, usually uh, there are some um, usage where they have a data center in the cloud and they also have a data center that's uh, distributed. It doesn't need to be super constrained. It, it just happens that it is disconnected and the analytics need to happen in this distributed data center. Others are that you have a data center in the cloud or the uh, some part of your service is running uh, at a core location in the cloud. And then you also have a layer of constraint near edge. So think about some industrial, industrial PC or um, some server room in, in, in a store or, or um, maybe some uh, drone with, with more capacity. Um, and then you have also, also other solutions or other implementations where you have the core data center and you have some sort of the computation done on the far edge on the device itself. Uh, things like intelligent agriculture, where a very small drone is out there inspecting uh, the fields to determine the, the optimal levels of um, the water or, or uh, fertilizer. And either it's doing the computing on the drone and then sending the insights to the cloud or uh, sending the data to the cloud. So, um, And then the other one that uh, we also see uh, very common is to have uh, solutions that are uh, kind of like turnkey solutions where you see uh, everything or, or you have all of the different capabilities in, in one box and in, in, in it has the ability to uh, train models, uh, serve, uh, monitor, and, and everything is packed there and you, you just have this kind of like appliance uh, that will give you all of the capabilities needed. Um, so uh, what are some of the edge computing footprints uh, that we have when we're talking about edge? Where can, if I have a workload that I want to run, uh, an AI powered workload that I want to run, where can I install it? So uh, first we have um, a regular or, or a compact cluster of OpenShift uh, with uh, three node, uh, three node, uh, uh, cluster with the compact with the worker nodes and the control plane on the same three uh, nodes, and we we saw we see a lot of these uh, type of, in, uh, of uh, footprint in telcos or uh, in smart manufacturing where they are not so constraining resources. Uh, you can also have the control plane in at the core and then one worker node on the edge location. So we see also again this in telco. Um, or in IT and data collection gateways. Uh, you can have OpenShift uh, single node uh, or SNO uh, for let's say in vehicle field operations or um, single server operation or in disconnected environments where again, the resources are, are being more and more constrained. And then finally you have uh, Red Hat Device Edge, which includes RHEL for Edge and uh, Microsoft, which is the, the smallest of the footprint. So if you, are really, really um, worried uh, about the usage of um, resources. And uh, this is like the, the smallest footprint that we have. Um, oh, sorry. So um, what we have seen is that uh, one of the accelerators uh, for Edge are containers. So, as, as we said, in, in order to give uh, maximum flexibility to the solutions that we build, uh, there are multiple things that you can do. So one of them is uh, to avoid any risk when deploying these uh, intelligent applications to edge location, uh, is to make sure that whatever you tested in a connected environment at the core is the exact same thing that you are deploying in, a, in disconnected environments. And uh, containers are really good for that because they are very portable, they are immutable. Uh, you can also uh, embrace microservice architectures, so you can bake in uh, some capabilities when the resources, uh, the, when the device is not so constrained in resources. So things like tracing, uh, monitoring, maybe do some 
testing of these uh, metrics on site. And when it happens that you are more constrained on resources, well, um, you can opt out uh, of these sort of capabilities. And uh, these containers are very easy to track, uh, to sign for security reasons. Uh, it's really easy to version them, and there is a whole set of tooling around them. So we see containers as one of the better accelerators for Edge. And then uh, the other thing that we saw is that uh, right now we kind of see that there are two approaches uh, to how to develop applications uh, powered by AI. So, and it's kind of like a, an approach where you have a full stack data scientist that knows not only how to train models, but also knows about infrastructure and also knows about how to develop applications. Uh, in these versus you have an MLOps platform teams that set up all of these tools for the data scientists. And the data scientist is more um, focused on really the hard aspects of training models and, and optimizing them for edge. So in the in the story with the full data uh, stack data scientist, uh, the data scientist has uh, the, the tools to, to, to do uh, training and experimentation of models, or so, uh, most of them based on Python or R. Um, Jupyter Notebooks as the development environment or some other um, it, uh, local uh, tooling. And once the model is trained, um, it just needs to make the model available to one of the uh, most important pieces of uh, an MLOps platform, which is the model server. And the model server is capable of, without any deep knowledge about the platform, the underlying platform, the underlying Kubernetes platform, it's capable of taking that model from that uh, location and uh, figure out everything needed to run that model in production from versioning, uh, handling the, risk, the request, uh, publishing uh, uh, an API uh, with multiple uh, communication protocols, uh, some uh, models are receiving half uh, capabilities to do some A-B testing or canary deployment. Um, and it also has the way to determine uh, where does the model needs to, needs to be deployed um, depending on the demand. And it can do things like scaling out uh, the model and scaling it down and even decommissioning the model. So it handles a lot of the, uh, of the life cycle, not all of it, but uh, a lot of it. And it also includes some monitoring capabilities. So that way, the data scientist, really the only interface it has with the infrastructure is uh, the model server. And the, 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 the input for the model server is um, the, the, the train model itself. And the output is um, a deployed model that it's already as accepting requests. Um, the other approach that we see, uh, oh, sorry, uh, with this approach, uh, we see that it has a lot of pros uh, 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 of advantages because it really simplifies the task of deploying models at scale. Uh, so you don't need to, if you have a huge Kubernetes footprint or, or a huge Kubernetes cluster and you want to do things like um, uh, distributing the workload, uh, scaling the model, uh, you want to reuse that uh, infrastructure for different types of model, not just one time, or, or you have, or, or you want to use that as a centralized MLOps platform for all of your teams. You can very easily do it with Model Server, and it takes charge of all of the multi-tenant aspects in and, and all of the uh, governance aspects in, in, of the model. Uh, it can handle some of the model lifecycle without uh, the data scientists having to do anything. Um, well, it, like actively do anything. And it can handle scaling and performance. Uh, some of the disadvantages with this approach, uh, in because, and, and this is the reason why it's not useful for everything, is that uh, the, the container that you get at the end, it's not really an immutable container because uh, the model server handles the way it uh, builds that container and how it downloads the dependencies and all of that is not something that you control. Uh, so because it's not immutable, sometimes it's difficult to troubleshoot or debug when uh, the, the model is being executed in remote locations. It is not as portable, so uh, you cannot 100 be sure 100% that what you 
test set is the same thing that it's going to be executed. Maybe the dependencies are different in different locations. So it's it's not as portable. Uh, it doesn't follow software engineer principles to deliver, build and deliver software. So this is more uh, AI centric, it's not as um, DevOps uh, centric, uh, but it's definitely better for the data scientist. Uh, the other approach is, well, when you have an MLOps platform team, that it not only includes MLOps engineers, but uh, in here, the, the data scientist, uh, again, has all of its tools to train the model and experiment. Um, the, the end product of that uh, training and experimentation is a, a model. And once it is uh, trained and it, the, the data scientist is satisfied with, with the result, it will store the model in uh, a model uh, repository that where the model will be versioned and will be tracked in the lineage of all of the artifacts of that model. Uh, will be um, will be uh, recorded and you you will be able to audit them at any point. And from there, the MLOps uh, team uh, can build a pipeline where different profiles and different personas can contribute to that pipeline. So for example, the MLOps engineer to automate the whole process of deploying an immutable container, the security specialist to do things like signing the model, or handling their certificates or the authentication to deploy in certain locations. Uh, you can even have a compliance specialist. So here it's more uh, like a multidisciplinary team. And at the end, uh, what you end up is again, a model that's deployed somewhere in a Kubernetes um, cluster and that it's running. And uh, you also have some monitoring capabilities for the data scientist and the MLOps engineer. So, to support the data scientists, uh, you can have the best of, of the two worlds. So you can either uh, give each one of the different profiles involved in uh, the process of putting a model into production. You can give them a specialized tools for each one of them. So for example, for MLOps engineer, you can give them things they already know, like Tecton pipelines or uh, customized to handle their configuration on the different stages. Um, for the integration specialist, you have integration tools like uh, Kafka or um, and so on. Or uh, what we are trying to do on uh, OpenShift Data Hub is to build some abstraction layers where the data scientists, if preferred, can still control the whole life cycle of, uh, of, of the model uh, with these abstraction layers to all of these different uh, skills and capabilities that are needed, so security, uh, monitoring, etc. The, the, the data scientists doesn't need to know in depth how are they working, just that they are included in the platform. But if there is a team of MLOps engineers that are uh, operating the platform, they also have they still have access to these, um, let's say, lower level tools that are running on OpenShift. So even if the data scientist defines let's say, a, a pipeline to automate the deployment using uh, Python and Elyra, uh, an MLOps engineer will be able to log into uh, the platform and look at the actual code, the, the workflow implementation running the pipeline and, and see YAML and containers and, and things that uh, that profile knows. So we, we think this is uh, some uh, the best of the two approaches. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, so for that, uh, one of the, we are trying to identify all of these different tools that are needed depending on the persona. And this is a picture that kind of depicts what do you need to have like a full platform to be able to deploy AI models at the edge. Uh, something, uh, there are tools specialized for uh, the data capture and the algorithm development uh, for training and doing auto ML where uh, conversion and compilation is specific for the device and on device performance estimation, it's really important. Model compression and optimization, because again, we are, we could be deploying to very constrained uh, devices. So this is what we think we, a, a full, uh, MLOps platform should have. And this is finally how the model uh, lifecycle looks like. Uh, you have a version control, 
um, capabilities that could be based on Git or on specific uh, tools for AI, um, or even open source uh, repositories of models like Hugging Face that these days is, is quite popular. And then you have a CI CD pipeline to be able to uh, package the model into a container image that then gets stored in another registry for distribution. And at the edge, you have some sort of component that is capable of managing the life cycle of the model once it is deployed. And as we saw, it, it follows the, the different um, approach that it's needed for edge, where it has to constantly pull uh, the, the, the changes and the configuration from the core location. Um, so that's what I have today. Thank you very much. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Thank you so much, Miriam. It looks like we have one question in the chat that we can get to. We've gone a little over time, so I'll make this very, very quick. Um, <clears throat> uh, we've got a question about enabling the GPU support in ODS. Does it support the NVIDIA GPU add-on? As I have seen in the docs, it's no longer supported. Yeah, we are working on having better support of uh, you know, the, the, the CUDA framework for GPUs uh, for NVIDIA and also trying to work with other uh, providers um, like Intel to also do CPU acceleration. Uh, but yeah, at the moment, we are working on that capability. It, it will right. come. Well, thank you so much. And uh, we will see you all in the next session coming up shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you.